Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Grace Holland. Cancer, liver and heart damage in adults, and developmental defects in kids. These are some of the health risks linked to per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. You may know them as PFAS or forever chemicals. They've been found in water systems across our state, maybe even the one you drink from. There was no limit or regulation on its presence in drinking water until Wednesday, when the EPA came to Fayetteville to announce new federal rules. WREL climate reporter Liz McLaughlin joins us now. She was there for that announcement. Liz, thank you. Thanks for having me. This is something that's been developing in our state for a few years now. Um, How did we get to this point? I think there was really an explosion of awareness for this problem and the broad scope of this problem when researchers in North Carolina found um, PFAS in the Cape Fear River. And they were able to uniquely fingerprint that to a company called Camores, formerly owned by DuPont. Now, these chemicals have been around for decades. Uh, you may remember Teflon, nonstick cookware. If you have a Gore-Tex rain jacket, if you get most fast food wrappers, um, pizza boxes, they all use this stuff, um, forever chemicals. And it's because they repel water, grease, heat. It's very, um, it has a lot of characteristics that companies and customers want. But the trade off maybe people didn't fully know the extent of that, the toxicity of these chemicals, and how long uh, they'd stick around. They repel heat, water, grease, because they're so good at doing that. They also stick around in your body and the environment for a really long time. Okay, and what are some of the health effects of that? More studies come out, uh, you know, every time I I turn my head. Um, There's a more and more robust body of research than there ever was. Uh, some of the legacy chemi- chemicals, those first used in those, you know, non-staining uh, carpets and things like that, it's called PFO and PFOS, part of these rules, and those have been linked uh, with cancers. This class of chemicals has been linked to developmental uh, issues in children, uh, reproductive harms, including birth defects, uh, immuno, um, you know, basically weakening your immune system, uh, high cholesterol, the list goes on and on. So uh, essentially there's like 10,000 of these chemicals. Um, They're different kinds of compounds, all kind of under the same umbrella. And so a body of research is the way our research system works. You know, you really can't make a definitive link until lots and lots of extensive studies. So uh, until there's a robust body of research, uh, it's really hard to regulate or litigate these things. Um, someone I just talked to at the announcement event said, isn't it interesting that's the way our system works? You have to prove something is harmful instead of the other way around, proving it's safe before it's going into people's homes and on their bodies. Right. And it does feel like there's a lot of awareness about this now. I, I, I know there's like some cookware now that advertises, hey, we don't use PFOS in our products. <laughs> people are really trying to actively look uh, to not have it in their homes as much as they can, um, or like trying to find filters that don't use it, that kind of stuff, which I know is difficult. Um, And then, you know, just since I've moved up here to North Carolina, I moved up in 2018, and that was kind of right around, I feel like, when some of this conversation about PFOS and the Cape Fear and all that was getting started. Um, I used to work in Eastern Carolina. I remember there was a whole thing uh, in Maysville where they had found it in their drinking water and had to switch over to Jones County. And people were really, really afraid at that point of what this was going to mean and had meant over years that they didn't even know about. So what has this kind of created, I guess, um, in like North Carolina culture when it comes to keeping an eye on their water? I mean, you know, it is troubling. We're looking at data from drinking water systems, and it's not just Fayetteville. It's not just Wilmington, where you may have heard, you know, a a lot of action there in in 2017, 2018. It's in 99% of Americans. It's in unborn babies and umbilical cord blood. So this is really a problem that's ubiquitous, and it's, um, you know, we're having to kind of figure out this cleanup as we're still manufacturing and using this. You mentioned, you know, trying to find cookware that didn't have PFAS. I was trying to look for, you know, something like waterproof mascara. 
it's not labeled. Even if you try wow, to yeah. in contact with this stuff, it's really hard to find. But drinking water, the reason that this has been sort of spearheaded as a, um, a target, a priority in fighting or battling this contamination crisis is because that's really where we see really high levels of exposure. Um, and, and where North Carolinians who've had really serious health issues have been wondering, is this what was causing my cancer, my illness? Um, and Burlington, we just did a series that really tested a lot of water systems. Um, Burlington also has a lot of contamination issues. Um, Fayetteville, Raleigh has some, but we'll be under these new rules based on the, the last test that I saw. Um, you know, Durham, Chapel Hill, um, elevated levels of PFAS. So it's not just far away, these people with private wells. It really is... Um, 100 million Americans across the U.S. have have drinking water from a public system uh, that has that has elevated levels of PFAS. So this is going to be a very big problem to tackle, but this is a, a step forward. So as we move into this, what are these new regulations? So these are drinking water standards. You may have heard some things before. There were health advisory limits, a sort of, hey, this isn't good if you have levels above this number, but this is the first time in the nation that there have been legally enforceable limits on how much of this stuff can be in your water. Now, this is only for six different um, PFAS compounds, the ones that's in Teflon, I mentioned PFOA, PFOS, and also GenX that you might have heard Mm -hmm. uh, manufactured at a Camores plant here in Fayetteville, part of that. But again, these are six chemicals. There are roughly 10,000, so there's a big push to try to manage these as a class instead of individually, but this is the EPA's approach as the safest way to kind of avoid litigation because these chemicals have the strongest body of research to show there are health harms and that um, taking the investment to upgrade infrastructure to get this stuff out is worth the public health issue that exposure brings up. So there's a limit maximum contamination limit on five of those different compounds and then any of the four combined if they go over a certain limit that's also not okay all right well we're going to take a quick break right there and we'll be right back liz before the break you were kind of explaining how these new regulations are going to be working um I wonder, what was it like at that announcement today? Just kind of give us a feel for it. And why did federal officials make it there in Fayetteville specifically out of all the places in the country? You know, there was really an air of celebration. A lot of people who were in attendance were people who had, um, you know, been fighting for regulations, activists because they had found out they were exposed, maybe they had a child that was sick, um, started their own nonprofit because they saw a neighbor's that were sick or they were frustrated with, um, you know, trying to say, how do I get clean water and not having an answer? Uh, all of the public systems saying we're in compliance with current regulations, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a big celebration for the most part um, from a lot of the people who have been working to get this regulation done. Um, I think the reason, you know, Michael Regan, the head of the EPA was really started this battle from Fayetteville. Um, He was head of North Carolina's Department of Environmental Quality when this all first broke. So he's been sort of fighting this PFAS fight since the beginning, or at least the start of the fight here in North Carolina. And so um, it seemed like a, uh, you know, kind of ceremonial finish to, as he worded it, uh, I came to finish the assignment. Um, to get this drinking water standard through and announce it here because there has been such high contamination levels, some of the highest in the country, um, because Camores, formerly DuPont, had dumped forever chemicals into the Cape Fear River for decades. And they had accumulated. um, And so North Carolina got a bit of a head start in monitoring, testing, and cleaning up this stuff and taking action in the form of a legal settlement to get Camores to put in um, technology that would reduce emissions, basically stop, have this stuff flowing into the river. So um, I think that was sort of a ceremonial circle for for EPA. And just because this has been really ground zero for this nationwide contamination crisis. 
And how do we think that these new rules are going to affect our state, given all the work you've said that's gone in up to this here in North Carolina? I think it will have a big impact. I think one of the biggest impacts you and I and viewers will see is, um, and, and, you know, what a lot of utilities are, are fretting about is that these chemicals, because they are so persistent, they're so good at repelling that water, they're hard to get rid of. They're hard mm. to get out of the water, and it's expensive, and it's a long process. Um, some of these water treatment plants will have to expand the footprint of their area, so we're talking a huge construction project. I'm sitting in front of the P.O. Hoffler water treatment plant in Fayetteville right now. They are going to install granular activated carbons with a price, uh, carbon filters with a price tag of $90 million. Um, you know, the EPA announced an additional $1 billion in federal funding to help utilities meet this goal. That's in addition to some other funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law, something to the tune of $20 billion. But every single plant having to comply with these standards, it's going to be tough. It's going to be expensive. So it's raising a lot of other questions too. Hey, should we be regulating this at the source? Should there be, um, you know, some industrial regulations for industrial discharges, things like that, um, to kind of keep it from needing to be cleaned up in the first place? Um, cause, cause really the burden then will fall on taxpayers for just the federal funding to support this investment and repair because it's almost guaranteed that at least a little bit some of this cost will be passed on to you and I paying the water bill when we didn't um, necessarily put that PFAS in the water. And do we know when we might start to see those potential rate hikes if they happen or just some of the changing of the infrastructure that would have to go into it? There is some time. So uh, water treatment facilities, there's a lot of grant programs too that are popping up. There's a lot of um, movement behind kind of fighting and tackling this so there could be you know some projects could be fully funded so it's not a guarantee talking to the ceo of the public works commission here in fayetteville today um talking to raleigh they seem to think that maybe they can you know find out the funding without it being a substantial increase the um, nationwide these utilities have in about three years um until 2027 to um, at least start initial monitoring and then within five to have these, um, you know, systems in place to be able to remove it and then report it to the public if there is a violation, if there are levels above these regulations. And Liz, as someone who's covered this for quite a while, what do you make about these new rules and just what this says about where we are in this fight against PFOS that we found ourselves in? You know, I do think that um, this will help people who have been exposed have access to safer water. Um, it's just, you know, and, and if that's the goal, that will happen. I think that I'm a little overwhelmed. The more and more I learn, the, wide, the broader this problem seems to be, the more complex it seems to solve it. Um, it's used in a lot of uh, even green technology, uh, medical application, you know, these companies wouldn't keep making these chemicals if there wasn't uh, a lucrative market for it. So it, it's pretty complex to figure out where that burden will fall. Is it on waste treatment plants and companies to clean it up? Is it on consumers to not wear waterproof mascara anymore? <laughs> is it on these companies to find responsible alternatives? It really is a complex issue. And I just think there is a lot more work to be done um, to figure out how to get this out of our um, out of our environment, and it's really gone into every single level of the food system: um, dogs, horses, farm animals, plants in Fayetteville. Some recent studies at NC State show that there is PFAS in that. So, um, drinking water definitely think it's a first step. Um, but if our goal, or if you know, the goal is to not be exposed to PFAS, get it out of our bodies. Um, I think there's a long way to go there. And again, you know, 99% of us have it in our blood. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Liz. Another great way to get your WREL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email that's waiting in your inbox every morning with local news, events, and headlines to get you ready for the day. 
Sign up at WREL.com newsletter.